Hello, everybody. What's going on? This your girl Tiffany coming through right here live in effect. So today I am doing a video about Zora Neale Hurston. All right. On this day, she passed on January 28th, 1960. Now, Zora Neale Hurston has uh, made her contribution as an African-American woman who not only was an author, but a writer. And also, and also, she um, was an anthropologist. Peace to the chat. Peace to the chat. And so, before I get started, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell. Share this channel. Um, do all that great stuff. So, that way, when I come on, you guys will be notified and whatnot. So, I'm currently now on my Facebook page because I've been restricted from there. So, for those of you guys that's on my Facebook page... Uh, if you watch it on my YouTube channel, make sure you share my channel and all that great stuff. All right. So anyways, I want to go ahead and get into the topic about Zora Neale Hurston. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So here's the information right here. Got the screen posted up. So who was she? So now we're going to go into the intro and we're going to read what it says. So she was born on January 7, 1891. And she died on January 28, 1960. Uh, she was an American author, anthropologist, and filmmaker. She was portrayed, right? She portrayed racial struggles in the early 1900s American South and published research on hoodoo. The most popular of her fourth novels is Their Eyes Were Watch Was Watching God. Published in 1937, she also wrote more than 50 short stories, plays, and essays. Now, now the novels she came out with, Their Eyes Was Watching God. There was a movie with Holly Berry and um, what's the guy's name? Michael Ely. They played in the movie. Um, it was a nice movie. It was cool, you know. But I don't think it was like strongly depicted as the book. But anyways, yeah, I seen the movie a long time ago. It was back when I was in high school. And um, it was just interesting. I never knew they came out with a movie about that was pertaining based off her story or based off the book that she wrote. So, yeah, it's a, a movie called Their Eyes Were Watching God with Holly, Holly Berry and Michael Ely. So Holly Berry plays as the character, the young lady who done went through her phases, went through being in a relationship with different men. And uh, Michael Eagley plays as the young guy that she eventually falls in love with and get married and all that extra stuff. So, so yeah, you guys got to see it for yourself. But let me go ahead and continue. All right. So it says Hurston was born in Natasuga, Suga, Alabama, and moved with her family to Eatonville, Florida in 1894. She later used Eatonville as the setting for many of her stories. It is now the site of Zora Festival held each year in her honor. Okay. So in her early career, Hurston conducted an anthropological and ethnographic research while a student at Bernard College and Columbia University. She had an interest in African-American and Caribbean folklore and how these contribute to the community's identity. She also wrote fiction about contemporary issues in the Black community and became a central figure of the Harlem Renaissance. Her short satires, drawing from the african-american experience and racial division were published in anthologies such as the new negro and fire after moving back to florida hershen wrote and published her literary anthology on african-american folklore in north in north florida mules and men 1935 and her first three novels jonah's bird vine their eyes were watching god and moses man of the mountain also published during this time was Tell My Horse, Voodoo, and 
Life in Haiti and Jamaica, documenting her research on rituals in Jamaica and Haiti. So therefore, she put her work and energy into doing anthropological research. All right. So this is the part that many may not have known about Zora. So when we hear about Zora Neale Hurston, we hear about just the um, novels that she wrote and and just being a poet and all that other. So that's what we actually hear. But we don't hear about how she done did anthropological research and study into African culture, African history, Caribbean history, um, and the diaspora, all that great stuff. Okay, it says her strengths work concern both the African American experience, her struggles as an African American woman. Her novels went relatively unrecognized by the literary world for decades. Interest, interest was revived in 1975 after author Alice Walker published an article in such a Zora Neale Hurston in the March issue of Miss Magazine that year. Hurston's manuscript, Every Tongue Got to Confess, a collection of folk tales gathered in the 1920 was published prehumously in 2001 after being discovered in the Smithsonian's archives. Her nonfiction book, Barracoon, the story of the last Black cargo about the life of Cujo Lewis was published prehumously in 2018. All right, so we're going to read a little bit right here. It says she was the fifth child of eight children of John Hurston and Lucy Ann Hurston. All of her four grandparents had been born into slavery. Her father was a Baptist preacher and sharecropper who later became a carpenter and her mother was a school teacher. She was born, of course, she was born in Nata Saluga, Alabama. Okay. And it says where her father grew up and her paternal grandfather was the preacher of a Baptist church. So. Again, she moved to Eaton, uh, Florida, Eatonville, Florida, now which was one of the first all black towns incorporated in the United States. Hershey said that Eaton, he, Eatonville was home to her, and she was so young when she moved there. Sometimes she claimed it as her birthplace. A few years later, her father was elected as mayor of the town in 1897. In 1902, he was called to serve as a minister of his largest church, Macedonia Missionary Baptist. And it says Hurston lived for the rest of her childhood in Eatonville and described the experience of growing up there in her 1928 essay, How It Feels to Be Color Me. So her mother died in 1904. Her father subsequently married Maddie Mogay in 1905. This was considered scandalous as it was rumored that he had sexual relation with Morgay before his first wife death. Hurston's Father and stepmom sent her to a Baptist boarding school in Jacksonville, Florida. They eventually stopped paying her tuition and she was dismissed. Now, this is her work and study. Uh, in 1916, she was employed as a maid by the lead singer of the Gilbert and Sullivan Theoretical Company. In 1917, she resumed her formal education, attending Morgan College, the high school division of Morgan State University, a historically black college in Baltimore, Maryland. At this time, apparently to qualify for a free high school education, the 26-year-old began claiming 1901 as her year of birth. She graduated from the high school of Morgan State University in 1918. And so here it is, college and slightly after. Now it says, in 1918, Hershey began her studies at Howard University, a historically black college in Washington, D.C. She was one of the earliest initiates of 
Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, founded by and for Black women and co-founded the Hilltop, the university student's newspaper. She took courses in Spanish, English, Greek, and public speaking and earned an associate degree in 1920. In 1921, she wrote a short story, John Redding Goes to Sea, which qualified her to become a member of Alan Locke's literary club, The Stylus. All right, so how did she get into anthropology and ethnographic? Now, what is ethnographic, first and foremost? All right, so ethnography, which comes from the Greek word ethos, which means folks, people, nation, and graphic means I write. So it's a branch of anthropology and the systematic study of individual cultures. Anthrography explores cultural phenomena from the point of view of the subject of the study. Anthrography is also a type of social research involving the examination of the behavior of the participants in which, in a given social situation, understanding the group members' own interpretation of such behavior. Mm, that sounds familiar. That sounds really familiar. It sounds like to me that ethnography is more you would compare it to uh phenomenology. That's what ethnography sounds like, more like phenomenology. But anyways, that's what she went to school for a study. Um <laughs> All right, so let's continue. It says, Hershey left in 1924 and in 25 was offered a scholarship by Bernard Trustee and Annie Nathan Meyer to Bernard College of Columbia University, a women's college, where she was the sole black student. While she was at Bernard, she conducted ethnographic research with noted anthropologists Franz Bozas of Columbia University and later studied with him as a graduate student. She also worked with Ruth Bennett and fellow anthropology student Margaret Mead. Hurston received her BA in anthropology in 1928 when she was 37 years old. All right, it says. Hershey had met Charlotte Osgood Mason, a philanthropist and literary patron who became interested in her work and career. And she had supported other African-American authors such as Langston Hughes and Alan Locke, who had recommended Hershey to her. But she also tried to direct their work. Mason supported Hershey's travel to the South for research from 1927 to 1932 with a stipend of $200 per month. In return, she wanted Hershey to give her all give her all the material she collected about Negro music, folklore, literature, hoodoo, and other forms of culture. At the same time, Hershey had to try to satisfy Boaz as, yeah, as her academic advisor, who was a cultural relativist and wanted to overturn ideas, ranking cultures in a hierarchy of values. After graduating from Bernard, Hirschman studied for two years as a graduate student in anthropology at Columbia University, working further with Boaz during this period, living in Harlem in the 1920s. And this is when the rise of Harlem Renaissance came about. Hirschman had befriended poet Langston Hughes and Counting Cullen, among several other writers. Her apartment, according to some accounts, was a popular spot for social gatherings. Around this time, Hirschman also had a few early liter literary success, including placing in short story and playwriting contests and opportunity, a journal of Negro life published by the National Urban League. So go on talk about in 1927, she was married to Herbert Sheen, a jazz musician and former teacher at Howard, uh, and he later became a physician. They married in, in 1931. And in 1935, Hershey was involved with Percy Punter, Punter, a graduate student at Columbia University. He inspired the character of T-Cake in their eyes was 
were watching God. In 1939, while Hurston was working for the WPA in Florida, she married Albert Price. The marriage ended after a few months, but they did not divorce until 1943. The following year, Hurston married James Howell Peel of Cleveland. That marriage, too, last, lasted less than a year. So Hurston twice lived in a cottage in Owl Galley, Florida in 1929 and again in 1951. All right. All right, so let's go down to the anthropological and folkloric field work. All right, so Hurston traveled extensively in the Caribbean and the American South and immersed herself in local cultural practices to conduct her anthropological research. Based on her work in the South, sponsored from 1928 to 1932 by Charlotte Osgood Mason, a wealthy philanthropist, Hurston wrote Mules and Men in 1935. She was researching lumber camps in North Florida and com commented on the practice of white men in power taking black women as sexual concubines, including having them bear children. This practice later was referred to as paramour rights. What is that paramour rights? Sexual slavery, that's what it is. Sexual slavery, sexual exploitation is attaching the right of ownership over one or more people with the intent of cohesing or otherwise forcing them to engage in sexual activities. This includes forced labor, reducing a person to a sur surveil status, including forced marriage and sex trafficking persons, such as the sex trafficking of children. So it, it was called paramo rights based on the men's power under racial segregation and related to practices during slavery times. The book also included includes much folklore. Hurston drew from this material as well in the fictional treatment she developed for her novels, such as Jonah's Gerd Vine. All right, so she traveled to Georgia and Florida with Alan Lomax and Mary Elizabeth Barnacle for research on African-American song tradition and their relationship to slave and African antecedent music. Uh, she was tasked with selecting the geographic area and contacting the research subjects. All right, so she had traveled to Jamaica and Haiti for research with support from the Guggenheim Foundation. She drew from this research for her anthropological work, Tell My Horse. All right. And also say that she worked for the Federal Writers Project, part of the Works Progress Administration. All right. And from October 1947 to February 1948, Hurston lived in Honduras in the North Coast town of Puerto, Puerto Cortez. She had some hopes of locating either May Mayan ruins or bitches of an as yet undiscovered civilization. All right, while in Puerto Cortez, she wrote such a seraph on the Sawani set in Florida. Hershens expressed interest in the polyethnic nature of the population in the region. Many, such as the Mos Mosquito Zambu and Garifuna, were a partial African ancestry and had developed Creole culture. All right, so here's some pictures of her right here. All right, that's her in Florida. That's her playing the drums. All right, so so 
So go on say upon reaching a live oak, Hershen was surprised not only by the gag order the judge in the trial placed on the defense, but but by her inability to get resident in town to talk about the case. But blacks and white were silent. She believed that it might have been related to Dr. Adams' alleged involvement in the gambling operation of Ruby's husband, Sam McCullum. Her articles were published by the newspaper during the trial. Ruby McCullum was convicted by an all-male, all-white jury and sentenced to death. Hurston had a special assignment to write a, a serialized account. The life story of Ruby McCullum over three months in 1953 in the newspaper. Her part was ended abruptly when she and none disagreed about her pay and she left. Unable to pay independently to return Turn for the appeal and second trial. Hurston contacted the journalist William Bradford Hill, with whom she had worked at the American Mercury to try to interest him in the case. He covered the appeal and second trial and also developed material from a background investigation. Hurston shared her material with him from the first trial, but he acknowledged her briefly in his book. Ruby McCullum, woman in the Sw Swanee jail, which became a bestseller. Hershen celebrated that McCullum's testimony in her own defense marked the first time that a woman of African-American descent was allowed to testify as to the paternity of her child by a white man. Hershen firmly believed that Ruby McCullum's testimony sounded the death toll of Parama rights in the segregation itself. Among other positions, Hershen later worked at the Pan American World Airways Technical Library at Patrick, Patrick Air Force Base in 1957. She was fired for being too well educated for her job. Well, goddamn. She moved to Fort Pierce, Florida, taking jobs where she could find them. Hershen worked occasionally as a substitute teacher at age 60. Hershen had to fight to make ends meet with the help of public assistant. At one point, she worked as a maid on Miami's Beach, Reveal Alto Island. <sighs> wow. And it says her death. During a period of financial and medical difficulties, Hershen was forced to enter St. Lucie County Welfare Home, where she suffered a stroke. She died of hypertensive heart disease on January 28, 1916, and was buried at Garden of Heavily Rest in Fort Pierce, Florida. Her remains were in an unmarked grave until 1973. Novelist Alice Walker and fellow Hershen scholar Charlie D. Hunt found an unmarked grave in the general area where Hurston had been buried. They decided to mark it as hers. Walker Walker commissioned a gray marker inscribed with Zora Neil Hurston, a genius of the South, nov novelist, folklorist, anthropologist, 1901 to 1960. The line, uh, the line, a genius of the South, is from Gene Toomer's poem, Georgia Dusk, which appears in his book, Cain. Hershen was born in, 19, in 1891, not 1901. But so she lied about the year she was born just so she can go to school and get education. After Hershen died, her papers were ordered to be burned. Wow. A law officer and friend, Patrick Duval, passing by the house where she had lived, stopped and put out the fire, thus saving an invaluable collection of literary documents for postulatory Post was a post postary tea. The nucleus of this collection was given to the University of Florida's libraries in 1961 by Mrs. Marjorie Silver, a friend and neighbor of Hurston. Other materials were donated in 1970 and 71 by Frances Grover, daughter of E.O. Grover, a Rollins College professor and longtime friend of Hurston's. And in 1979, Stet Stetson. Kennedy of Jacksonville, who knew Hershen through his work with the Federal Writers Project, added additional papers. Zora Neal Hershen's paper, University of Florida, Smathers Libraries, and in August of 2008. All right. So. 
So that's uh that's the information about her. Uh, if you guys want to read more, you can. Oh, this is interesting. It says she was a Republican who was a who was generally sympathetic to the foreign policies, not interventionism of the all right, and a fan of Booker T's Washington self help politics. She disagreed with philosophies including communism and the new deal supported by many of her colleagues in the harlem renaissance such as Einstein hughes who was in the 1930s a supporter of soviet union and president in is several of his poems john mehorda has called hershton's american favorite black conservative oh well how interesting mm. All right, so here's all the information, and here's the list of books that she has written. The reference is at the bottom. Let me see if I can find that movie. Yeah, so the movie came out in 2005. All right, it started with Holly Berry as Janie Starks. Okay. So, yeah, here's the reference. And here's the further reading. And here's the external links. Excuse me, you guys. I'm just laying here because I don't feel like getting up, so I'm just laying down. All right, so um, so let's see. I have some more information that I would like to share regarding to Zora Neale Hurston. So that was very Okay, I'm bad. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to share some sources regarding to her work and her biography. Um, as usual, I always come over here to this website. If y'all can see the screen. So right here on this website, which is the archive.org. You can download the books for free. You know, you can borrow the books for a couple of hours or a couple of weeks. And you can even purchase some books. That's the beauty of it. But anyways. So here's the book about Zora Neale Hurston's right here at the bottom. All right, so if you guys want to look up any information, you can just type in her name and then pull up all the list of books. And here are a couple of PDFs. All right, so. This one is called Critical Companion to Zora Neale Hurston, a literary reference to her life and work by Sharon L. Jones. Now, she kind of look like Queen Latifah right here. She does. She looks like Queen Latifah. So, I mean, if you guys want to look into this, you can. So here's a table of contents. All right, 
So the title of the book called Critical Companion to Zora Neale Hurston, a literary reference to her life and work. Sharon L. Jones. All right, so here's another one. It's called Zora Neale Hurston Collected Plays, multi multi ethnic um, yeah, it's collection plays, multi uh, ethnic. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see what's the other title on here, but it's kind of cut off. But anyways, all right, but this is all her collection, her writings and stuff, her plays and her essays and all that great stuff. So if you want to check this out, you can just look up um, Zora Neale Hurston, Collected Plays. All right. All right, then, so it goes into introduction. It says, Zora Neale Hurston collected plays marked the first time that the extinct dramatic writings of Zora Neale Hurston has ever, has ever been collected in a single volume. This feat would have been impossible if not for the work of librarians at the Library of Congress. In 1997, they found over a dozen plays and sketches stored in various lo locations throughout their vast holdings and rescued them from obscurity by sharing them in public monthly readings. Add to this treasure trove of the library holdings and pieces from several informal publications and we end up with a clear picture of Hershen's theoretical output ranging from 1925 to 1944, a significant body of work that constitutes yet another facet of one of the most dynamic fe features, excuse me, figures of the Harlem Renaissance. We hope this book will help to eliminate Hershen's dramatic output in the same way that Alice Walker's effort in, in the 1970s brought her novels to the attention of a new generation of readers. Without production, plays are in, in Eric's incomplete blueprints for a live experience. We reproduce these works in the hope that theater scholars and students today will rediscover a highly original dramatic voice. All right, so you guys can check that out for yourself if you want to look into that. All right, so here's another one. This one is called the uh, Bloom's Modern Critical Reviews, Zora Neale Hurston. Okay. It's reviewing her work and her biography, her life. Um, and all the things she did as far as traveling to different places, doing her anthropological and ethnographic work. All right. So if you guys want to look more about this book, you can. He, here are the table of content. All right. Here's the table of content. So you can read it up for yourself if you want to learn more about it. All right. So with that being said, you guys, um, that's all for today. And of course, this is a very interesting information for me, learning more about Miss Hurston and what she has contributed 
within the African-American community. Obviously, she did a lot of extensive research, which took a while, especially um, dealing with certain subject matters such as this whole paramount rights or paramour rights, whatever, however you say it, which is dealing with sex slavery or what we know today as sex trafficking with that take place with black women. Um, one day I am going to make it my business to put the focus on this whole concept about the jazz bells and the uh, mammies and all that stuff, because I think we need to really get into that conversation more deeply on how the, how black women were viewed in such a manner, like, you know, viewed as the jazz bells, the bed winches and the, the um the mammies and all that so we want to get into that stuff uh you bring about the education um so i will keep you guys posted on that too but anyways this your girl tiffany and with that being said thank you for those of you that was watching and make sure you subscribe hit the notification bell and share this channel uh if you can thank you so much until then take it easy peace and power elevation be to all of you be safe, all right? Thank you.